Shit. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm like, we always forget to do that. We're like super businessy as we start. And I'm like, yeah. oh God. Three, two, one, bananas. Uh, hello, everyone. This is the show Isolated Tracks, produced by Justin Wilmore for 90.3 KEXP FM, a nonprofit radio station in Seattle, also streaming online at kexp.org. On the show, we look inside songs from some of our favorite artists, isolating tracks, and then putting them back together just to see how on earth the music gets made. I'm Julian Martlew, one of KEXP's live and production audio engineers. And today we're super psyched. We're talking with multi-instrumentalist and producer Jessica Dobson of Deep Sea Diver about the song Impossible Weight, which is the second single from the album of the same name on ATO Records. Hi, Jessica. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for doing this. Uh, this song has been blowing my mind. I love this song. It sounds so good. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, just uh, to start off, how do you begin when you're when you're making a song? Do you demo it out? Do you scribble words? Um, both of those things I do do, <laughs> and uh, I wish I had a formula for like what I did every time. Uh, this one is a really unique one that you chose for what the process was because this was this is the only co-write. Um, on the record and the only card I've ever done for Deep Sea Diver. So this was a song that came about in two, maybe three hours. And it was written in one sitting with uh, my co-writer, Jen Silvio. It was amazing. It was so crazy. Peter yeah, and I went down. Uh, Peter, who's in the band, plays drums and is also my partner. We went down to LA and uh, met Jen Silvio for the first time that day. And then we're just <laughs> like, jamming in her studio and this little riff came out of nowhere. The ding, 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 ding. And she like pointed at me and was like, what is that? Okay, that, <laughs> that's the start of the song. And I, was, I wasn't even trying. I was like playing nervously because, you know, it's like you first meet someone. You have to like build that chemistry with somebody and you're just kind mm. of like, you know, jumping off the boat and seeing what happens. And like, uh, it was just so sweet that it came about so quickly and I think it's because I wasn't thinking too hard because what's my process when I'm thinking too hard like a song sits for months <laughs> yeah rewrite everything and I can often tear a song apart too much so well I guess we should let's talk about uh the production a little bit yes um, fun I love talking about production <laughs> <laughs> so we recorded it at the hall of justice it's a small studio in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and then Andy Park, uh, my co-producer, I sent him the song like the day after because the original demo was just an acoustic track. I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be like an acoustic song uh, that had kind of a more feisty world and realm to it. Or, you know, I wanted to see what it sounded like with the more like pumping and stand up, you know, rhythm section and, and all of that. And I ended up spending like, I think a week with Peter and then the band, like the arrangement never changed, but we got an arrangement down. And then very quickly after that, we went to the studio for the Hall of Justice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let's get into it. You, know, you want to um, pull up the session and yeah. show us around? Totally. Um, I tried to like stick with like an autumnal color scheme here, but it just like logic. It's not Photoshop. It doesn't really have a, a color wheel. You know, I had very limited colors to pick from. So here's my trying to make it look like fall is here. <laughs> Trackless <laughs> color. <laughs> I dig it. I dig it. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you want to do first? Uh, I mean, what do you start with? Do you like build up from the drums or do you build oh, from... Oh, want to do oh. it like as we did it? Sure. It's recorded. Gosh, I'm trying to think of what was first. Let's start with the drums. Why not? Okay. Yeah, I, I I remember I did do like a scratch track of like guitar and vocals uh -huh. when I was in the mixing room, and then Garrett and Peter were in. I think drums were done first, and then bass because the the way the Hall of Justice is, it's like a triangle. It's, uh -huh. it's 
uh, Chris Walla, former member of Death Cab's old studio. And uh, you have to be really creative about the way if you want to do more than one person tracking. Um, it's like not the kind of place you want to go to if you want huge drum sounds in a, in a big room, you know, kind of like Ocean Way type stuff. Um, uh-huh. Or at Studio X is where we recorded all of the other tracks. So this is the tiny, tiny room. But we were trying to figure out how do we get similar drum sounds or just kind of like really punchy, um, but not dead drum sounds because it's a smaller room. And so what we did was Andy had this idea of moving the drums into like the corner and then opening up this like concrete closet door and putting uh, some room mics in there. And Uh so here is the drum sounds for Impossible Weight. Let's check it out. It starts with the kick drum. So what's sweet about the drum so far is like, it doesn't sound like it's in a small room, but you're going to really hear it kind of kick in when it goes to the chorus like this. Yeah, so what you're kind of hearing when you're doing that is there is an AKG BX20 reverb in that studio. And that's like a really cool trick is to put just a little bit of reverb on the snare. And Uh it kind of like blossoms out like... Yeah, so what's rad is like, I love the way Andy gets drum sounds and... I think, you know, just with like to get geeky with parallel compression and the way that the drums sound, you know, slightly overdriven. And uh, I think it was the first time he had like tried tracking drums that way because Hall of Justice drum sounds are usually known for being pretty dead and tight. Yeah. Boxy and cool. And like this one doesn't sound like it was recorded there. So I was proud of Andy for figuring that out. Yeah. Nice job, Andy. Good job. (laughs) Yeah, punchy drum sounds, I think, are like something that Deep Sea Diver is known for. And we were just like, how are we going to get that there? But we totally, I feel like we totally did it. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. Thanks. Uh, Cool. So then then you get some bass. Yes. Bass was recorded in a totally unique way on this one, too. Uh, I believe Garrett played his P bass on this one. often kind of goes in between pick and finger playing. I I think he just did pick on this. So I love Garrett's bass part on this track. It like dances around the guitar so well and it has a really cool attack to it. Also slightly overdriven. And what's (laughs) cool about this bass part is I believe originally it was P bass and like I think it was an SVT or recorded through a guitar amp, my Vox AC30. So that's like a secret that I learned from like reading way too many Justin Meldell Johnson bass uh, forum things. And Gary does the same thing too. And like uh, he's all about recording bass through PV amps and, and Voxes and things like that, untraditional, you know, things. And so I think it was recorded through a Vox, then reamped into an Ashdown, like a really tiny uh, speaker and like preamp. Uh And it has like, so I think he blended the two like mic'd amp signal. Because usually when you record bass, you're doing like DI plus amp or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, use your DI for your low end and then your amp for your punchy mids. But this one's too good. I'm pretty sure a bass and a guitar amp mixed together so you'll like what sounds pretty dope in the chorus here check it out now you kind of hear some of that grit and that growl yeah It's a great bass oh. part. 
It's so good. <laughs> yeah, it has like so much raw energy. It reminds me like a little bit of the the bass tone on one of my favorite bass tracks ever is uh, the Clash London Calling. And Paul oh, Simmons oh. is one of my favorite bass players. And when he that growl of that, like, I don't know if it was a Rickenbacker or a P bass, but when it first comes in, boom, boom, but like, it's like the bass tone I'm always chasing. And, uh, and Gary's like, such an incredible bass player and also just like has such a great ear for tone and i'm just really proud of the way the rhythm section sounds on the song yeah it's badass it's so good so should we get into guitars yeah okay cool and then maybe i'll do vocals next okay cool uh well of course this is one of my favorite worlds to talk about because i played them <laughs> yeah. um i think we used a few different guitars on this track. The first one being an old silver tone uh, that I used to own, but I ended up having to borrow one from Mike and Mike's guitars uh, down the road. And it's a guitar that I picked up when I was playing in the shins. It has these little cupcake knobs, a really, it's super hollow, very light. It doesn't even feel like you're wearing anything when, when you're playing it. A really cool black and sparkle body yeah. and it has a very unique character. And so... I think we ended up blending a silver tone in my jazz master. So this is the opening uh, guitar. And of course, a bunch of reverb on that. So. Yep. So there's like an equal amount, like jazz masters have this like attack and punchiness, but they can be a little glassy. And so that's why I wanted to like combine it with the silver tone and they're really dirty, growly, if you put it through like a smaller amp and overdrive it. And so, and then this song, I believe we put it, th we put a lot of stuff through the, the BX20, um, that spring reverb. So let's go, let's see what this is. I should have marked this better. Okay, so that's something I love doing uh, is using spring reverb as percussion. So yeah. I'll do that again. And I love this one pedal that I have, which is a Strymon. Uh, I think it's the Blue Sky or the Big Sky. It's the smaller one. And you can do this thing where you have like infinite reverb, but when you click it off, it completely shuts off. So it sounds super gated. And that's uh -huh. why it and then sucks back in. I had a note in my in my note of things to ask you about about this because I was like, that sounds like a spring reverb, but it feels like it's in the drum track, but it's not. Right. It's you. Yeah. You did it. Me. I did that a lot like on Wide Awake where I just like halt effects really quickly. Uh -huh. Love that wall of sound and then just like completely turning it off, especially when it comes to large plate reverbs. <sighs> That's a cool effect. All right. Such sweet sounds. That was Andy that had this idea to reverse uh -huh. the guitar. So I'll do that part again because it's one of my favorite things on the record. And what's really cool, I'll skip ahead a little bit too to like the background vocals. I doubled that part with vocal as well. Actually, I don't know, it might be on that track. We'll go back to that. It might be on the, the main vocal track, but I sang through an amp. Uh, yeah. So, all right. And then we get some jangly guitar. Make sure that's the jazz master. A uh, little more overdrive. What do you like to use? What did you use for this one? Because I know you got a lot of you got a lot of toys. I do. Yeah. Okay. So I think for this one, I probably used a combo of well, in the studio, it's it's so different than live. Like when you play live, if you bring tiny amps and you're playing through typical monitors, you're not going to be able to hear yourself. And so that's why I play with the bit larger amps, actually. That one behind me right there, the Benson. The Benson. But when you're in the studio, you can get away with um, 
or you can shape your sound more with like smaller amps. I think we had like a Fender Champ in there that was like a 10 inch speaker. And so the compression and the overdrive you get from driving the amp versus like driving a guitar pedal is completely different. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was a combo of a couple different amps. I have a vintage Supro um, that was a bass. It was meant to be a bass amp. It's like a 15 inch speaker, but it sounds pretty sweet when you overdrive it. And then um, Nels Klein recommended this. I When the shins were on tour, we kept running on the same circuits as Wilco. And so I obviously would look at Nels's pedal board and be like, what are you using? It. And he was, he's so, he's so rad. He's very down to earth and would be like, yeah, just play it. And so I would try out all these pedals and then I, would, I asked him, what's that one? And he was like, that's the earth drive. Um, I think it's Sarno music is the name of the company, but the earth drive is like a really, really natural transparent drive that like more brings out the quality of the guitar. So I think that was like used on the silver tone. And then my chase bliss, brother's pedal was probably the one used for all of the kind of reverse effects because I have, this is getting really dorky, but like I, I have it like on a pedal where I can, uh, like an uh, expression pedal where I can make it completely overdriven and then back off of it. So like, uh, I think I even did that in real time with a and then playing other things where I would kind of lean into the overdrive as it would come up and it would catch it and then you get a little bit more sustain. And so, yeah, uh-huh. that's what's happening in my guitar world right there. I think. Beautiful. I uh, so I guess one of my favorite parts is coming up. Um, I mean, I'll show you a little bit more of the, like, it's really pretty. This like definitely showcases just the interplay of all the guitar. <laughs> fun just to listen to it like even to be talking with you because it is exciting like it's exciting since i've listened like to the soloed tracks like this i mean i never really did and uh you know obviously like the guitar is like on one track that you're seeing right now and it was multi-tracked and we just kind of bounced it down to one thing but like it is pretty crazy because for the longest time we were trying to figure out like how did do, how does this chorus work and I kept kind of stepping over my vocal with different, just too chunky of guitar parts. And everything is so orchestrated in that chorus. And that I definitely give so much credit to Andy for helping me with that because uh, often I can overplay stuff and like, I don't know. I'm just like, we really tried to make everything in its right place on this record. And I really feel like this song shines in that in that regard. Um, so some this is such an interesting part, this next part, the bridge, to listen to soloed. It sounds like a different song. This is like my My Bloody Valentine influence. Some Radiohead in the bell-like, because it's two different guitar parts, and then this whammy. <laughs> So yeah, that's just me with the jazz master with the tremolo arm. Just yeah, doing my best, Kevin Shields. I love one note, like when you hang on it, it's such tension. But that sounds yeah. like, like a doom song. Yeah. But when you put it together with the bass that's creating the melody under it and the keys that are on top of it, it's pretty crazy. So here's like the whammy. Uh, in real time, I was kind of just like it's the classic like Johnny Greenwood, Tom Morello uh, from Rage guitar pedal where you can pitch shift stuff in real time. So good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Key World... Yeah. Uh, what up, me and Elliot? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things about, like, when I was writing the 
or like recording the guitar part, I always envisioned uh, like a fade in swelling of uh, like effects that that sounded like um, as, as mysterious as the guitar part. And I really like I'm a big fan of Arvo part. He's like a minimalist Estonian composer. And he always has these like really high, Bjork does this a lot too. There'll be this kind of high sustaining note and, and then uh, a juxtaposition of, of uh, whatever, something different that's either busy or like bubbling under the surface. And so like, that's what Elliot and I's parts, Elliot's and I's parts were in the beginning under the guitar. So I'll solo that for you. The high thing is me on the prophet. And then here comes Elliot with his really cool loop. He created this on his profit too. This- yeah, so it's like, I don't know, it, it creates this feeling of tension. Um, the way those notes sustain. And that's, I feel like that's a really special part. Yeah. And works really well with maintaining the kind of, yeah, that brooding, mysterious guitar part alongside of it. Um, and then, yeah, it just gets really fun. So this is where I love talking about the Lambda. That's the synthesizer that we used on this track. And I bought, I immediately bought a Lambda. It's a Korg Lambda. It's from like 1979 is when it came out. Mm-hmm. It's like one of the most, I hate talking about it cause I, I just want to own all of them in the world. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, a, it's like one of those things where you kind of want to keep the secret. Yeah. But, uh, it's one of the coolest synthesizers. Like if you're into New Order and a lot of like those 80s classic like synth string sounds, like this one is very unique. And mm-hmm. uh, it reminds, it just sounds to me like a Twin Peaks soundtrack. You can get those kinds of sounds out of it. And uh, that's what was used on the chorus. <laughs> Like most synths, it has like a pitch bend. Get the wheel. Really freaking sweet about the Korg Lambda is it has two, so it's like three oscillators and two separate parts that you can choose. There's like an ensemble and a percussive part. So you can mix your string section with like an electric piano. Uh So that's where you get some of that like attack plus lushness is like. And there's also this really awesome onboard phaser that you control with a joystick. So you, there's a lot going on on the Korg Lambda. <laughs> and it, it, it just actually looks pretty cool. You should look it up. Um, just as a an apartment or a house piece. It, like, you know, it's <laughs> made of like real wood and has that classic organ look. And it's it's one of my favorite synthesizers in the whole world. It's so good. Okay. Uh, Elliot brought this really obnoxious looking thing called the clapper into the studio. And like, it's basically, you go like this, it's like two pieces of wood and it like ends up clapping, hence the (laughs) the clapper, but it's so damn loud. And like, I would all, he would always be using it when I wasn't like expecting it. And it's just the sharpest sound, but this is the clapper. I think with the synthesizer doubled with it. So it's like, just all right. That's awesome. And then all the lights just go out. Totally. Yeah. So like, this is what it sounds like in cut. Hey, picking up the pieces, put them down. It has like, I think we put like a profit with like pink or white noise underneath it. Because, you know, it's like, I'm constantly trying to find how to pull things out of context. Like you wouldn't think that was this wooden instrument that was just mic'd with like a regular mic like this. And that's no, it's cool. got it's got like some Phil Collins vibe too. Exactly, you know? totally, kind of a weird gated gated yeah. sound. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's I like these little things that come on in almost as call and responses to at that point Sharon singing. Yeah. Um, and then I think we get into like. Uh, Oh yeah, his little bubbly synth comes in. 
of my most favorite Do parts. I don't want to ruin it. Let me start it here. I think this was made with a Yamaha synth. It's like this little, it's kind of quiet, a little buzzy. Is it, is it like arpeggiated? To yeah, him? I think so. Because he has like a, like a line six, like looper that he would put things through or reverse it or whatever. Mm. Um, and then this is where I have a lot of fun. I have this profit keyboard and it's on a lot of the record. It's on switchblade. This particular like thing that I like to do on the profit is like set the keys to like infinite sustain and then just really mess around with the oscillators and throw it through the VCO. And so this is here. Letting notes sustain, opening up the filter. So it, what it creates, like, on top of that, it doesn't sound like much on its own, but... So it's subtle. It's just, like, this little colored white noise with some, like, with a little bit of melody in it that that's the kind of stuff that I like love exploring when it comes to recordings, especially when you wear headphones. Cause you're like, what is that sound? And I, I like doing that on every song. What is that sound? And so that was where I had a lot of fun with keys on this one. Oh, I love the detune too. Just like adding some complexity to the harmony. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I can't, I'm surprised I saved the vocal for last. Maybe I'll do well, that the percussion, but. Everybody always wants to know. So you get you have a great voice, Thank and you. the recording is like the the power of this particular vocal is just it's stunning. So you got to like let the cat out of the bag. What are what are you using on the way in? I think what it's you know with like vocals. What I think what makes this one interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, is it was doubled with. Um, Kind of, I need to give credit to that Feist record uh, and, and, and previous Feist records where I do love how in the studio and also live, she uh, either reamps her vocal in the studio. Um, so it's, yeah, running through an amp. So she'll record it, I believe, on like a really nice microphone and then blend the two signals after she puts the second signal through an amplifier. And it creates this slightly you know, it depends on what you do to the amp, but you can have, there's a character to putting anything, especially a vocal through an amp that you can't get from having a clean signal. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what tubes are in the amp and how are you driving it. And so for this one, I believe it was Andy's champ that we put the second vocal through or I ended up seeing. So here's my original vocal. I uh, believe it's the, that classic AKG 20 spring reverb again, a real one. Here we go. This is what it feels like walking in a straight line, straight talk clicking in my ear. This is what it feels like, cliff dive, broken mind, wondering how I got here. A million. Here's the doubled vocal on its own. In time, sound tight, speed it out, never mind. I think I'm a to the fear together stuttering my heart up from the hurry up stop dragging my heels around dragging my heels around it like makes me smile i love those background vocals so much the dragging my heels those really airy the high. yeah um and <laughs> i think we may that i'm proud of those because if I don't have the demo on me, but we did do a demo of the song before we went into the studio mm. with the band. And I flushed out a lot of that, those background vocals before we went in. Cause I was just trying to be as prepared as possible. I think we only had two days to do the song. Yeah. And this, I forgot to mention this song was written after we had called the record finished. And so, um, it was like, 
when it was kind of like this surprise thing that we had this extra song to go on the record, which then became the title track. And yeah, just wild to me how that worked out. And I think it's because we weren't thinking too hard about it. it. Like it was, we were just having fun. Yeah. And so I think that's special. And yeah, I, but I remember, um, you know, this is like, I don't have a lot of nice mics in my home studio. I can rent some, but like, I think I did the dragging my heels around on this one and put it through a ton of reverb. And then I was like, Andy, just either let's use those or let's recreate a, a better version. And I think we ended up recreating, but yeah, um, here comes the chorus. Dragging my heels around, but that was then, and this is now. So I love the character. I think it was through not an Echoplex. Why am I completely blanking right now? Um, hold on a second. I think I put notes up here. Oh, Space Echo. I'm pretty uh -huh. sure that's a Space Echo. And uh, yeah. Like the uh, the actual analog tape one? Yeah, or? I believe so. Wow. Yeah. wow. So cool. Yeah. I mean, it is crazy. Like a lot of, you know, the effects, especially in other songs were done in post, like in with like universal audio effects. Uh, Daryl Thorpe is the mixer for this record. And he's, I think, like repped by them, but like, he has everything. And, and that can get you into trouble. And I, yeah. I we try to be as specific as possible for what we wanted and just like subtle tone shaping things. But like, I, I started doubling vocals early on when I first got into Elliot Smith. He's the king of doubling that vocal to a four track and, and 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 there's a there's sometimes you can get a lot thinner sounding vocal ironically people think that the more you layer your vocals the bigger it's going to sound but once you get into multi-tracking and compression and how you how much you can push those vocals oftentimes it sounds like a thinner smaller vocal so i'm really proud of how this one turned out with just like i think it's because it had such different character to it with like the vocal amp and the Spring reverb we use and the, and the the delays and all that stuff. So when we did the, uh, it was like a tar and MS twenty or the lambda and my vocal here. Stand oh yeah, sorry. I'll do it with the keys. I love doubling things like that. Steady right. as a you know, y'all want to hear Sharon's vocal. Oh yeah, we do. <laughs> It was so crazy when I first first got the vote. I I couldn't believe that it worked out for her. To so you sent it to her, and she yeah. recorded it and sent it back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I sent her the song like I think in like we recorded it in early February of 2019, and she was just kicking off her "Remind Me Tomorrow" tour, and her record was blowing up, and I was so happy for her and like. Um, I was like, there's no way, like, I don't think she'd have time or, you know, and you never want to assume someone even is down for something, but like sent it over and she was like, I love this song and I want this to work. And it was just kind of like seeing how if schedules would line up and finally a few months later, it just did. I got a text in the middle of the night. She's like, I can do this. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is so sweet. <laughs> so she was in New York at the time and uh, I think her label has like a studio out there and send to the track. And I was just like, I think it would sound super sweet if you took the second verse and then just send whatever. Like I didn't, I, I just, I, I, when you inherently love what somebody does, you don't try to like bottle cap it or like, you know, it's just, you just say, yeah, do your yeah. thing. Because one of the things that she is so good at is harmony. And, and not just traditional harmony, but she's, she reminds me, like there are a few people in this world, Bjork, Tom York, Sharon, even Feist, like they pick harmonies that you wouldn't expect at first. And oftentimes it can be really cool and dissonant. And that's something that I love doing. And so, yeah, I didn't tell her what harmonies to sing or anything like that. But anyways, here's Sharon's verse. Steady as the wheel turns on my way. It's okay, picking up the pieces, put them down. Stuttering my heart from the hurry up stop dragging. So 
you'll hear that I just like doubled some select parts or whatever. And that's yeah. part of the arrangement. It's just like what lines need to hit, you know? And so I kind of synced up with her on that last stutter in my heart. Stutter in my heart from the hurry up stop. Dragging my heels around. Dragging my heels around. Dragging my heels around. But then, was then, and this is now. I tried so hard not to let you all down. It's an impossible way. I love that harmony she does. So good. Uh, I forgot to mention on the bridge, one kind of fun fact for the song is Andy had me run in place as I was, it's a, it's a, I think, a, I don't know if he got it from David Byrne from Talking Heads. I know I'd read that Eno would have, um, like Fear of Music is one of my favorite records and that's a Talking Heads record and like, you know, would have... David Byrne run and run around the block sometimes and then um, do, I think Bowie would do the same thing. It's like, you know, you get in, in your head when you're in the studio and you have your delivery that you do and that can be so boring. And so like, this is me running around. <laughs> That lesson. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's the best take. There was a, some. Obviously, it's not going to sound good on every take when you're like out of breath and trying to deliver, you know, a passionate, impossible weight lyric. But like, uh, I don't know. That's the fun of the studio. Got so you like add, you added a whole bunch of emotion to it somehow. Yeah, totally. Uh, the last thing that I have that I that I'll play. Some crazy percussions. Some crazy per is a tambourine. Crazy. No, <laughs> crazy. Here's a. Okay. Let's be honest. When I first played it, did it sound like a fart? Oh, I didn't think that because no, I, I, had, I just thought it for one second. I heard it on the song so many times. <laughs> I thought it was the drum. I thought it was Tom Phil's that you had processed somehow. So yeah. Oh no, I'm not saying on the song it sounds like one, but alone, you know, it's like uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. It's funny. All right. So I think it was uh, Andy distorted these bongos that Peter played uh, and just like crushed the hell out of them. A lot of like the a couple. Andy got me into these plugins called Sound Toys. Oh, yeah. And there's the decapitator, and you just crush the hell out of something, and it has a really analog vibe to it. But um, yeah, here's a. Here's how it sounds in context. Freaking sweet. It reminds me of like a, almost like a pitch shifted eventide. The eventide was very popular in the 70s and 80s, but. Um, I want to get that big one so you can really hear it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's got like a vocal quality. Mm, totally. Um, yeah, that's so great. I'm glad you showed me that because I was wondering what that was. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, <laughs> I I think that's everything. I mean, obviously, you know, this is the more like condensed stem version of the song, but I, those are the main players. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Is there anything else you want to talk about, like production wise? I mean, I could talk to you about mixing for days. So we should probably we should probably let it let it be what it is. I feel this like is, we talked about the stuff that doesn't get too dorky. We didn't get this is an audio podcast. This is for people that want to hear just like the inside scoop and a little bit of audio dorkiness, right? A little bit of audio dorkiness is always good. And, and I mean, I think most of the people are making music and they just want to like get some inspiration. Yeah. Well, I hope this was inspiring for you. Uh, 
this is like, I, I think what a testament to like, to this song of, of why it turned out so sweet is like, there really isn't a lot going on. I, I think it's sometimes when you have, especially in digital recording, it's like you track, 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 and your song is bloated and you're like, it's, it's like, I don't know. I really feel like this one was less is more and everything has its own pocket and like, and there was no like crazy gear that was used to record this song. You know, like mm -hmm. it's all affordable things, I believe. <laughs> Maybe there was some outboard gear in the studio that I couldn't afford, but like, I don't know, wherever space, whatever space you're in, you can make whatever you need work. Yeah. Yeah. I totally believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. For anyone who popped in in the middle and didn't know what they were watching, this is the show Isolated Tracks on KEXP's YouTube channel. We're a nonprofit radio station in Seattle, and we've been talking to Jessica Dobson of Deep Sea Diver about the song Impossible Wait, which you should go listen to the mixed version right now right. on repeat. And then you should cop the album because... It's it sounds amazing and it's really really good, uh, and thank you for being here, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. And maybe we can let Justin come out of your hole. Justin, where you at? There he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You're not gonna escape that catchphrase, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know at the end of every episode, it's Justin, come out of your hole. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Cool. Maybe uh, the next time I see y'all, it'll be in person when the uh, virus is gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, y'all. All right. All right. Take Bye. care. I'll see you soon. Bye. See ya. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.